You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Barbell Logic podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Sims strength coach and nutrition coach at Barbell Logic Online Coaching, also the chief experience officer. With me is Andrew Jackson. Hello. Hello. He is also a strength and nutrition coach and the product manager for the TKC software and app, and also the chief operations officer. Nice to be with you. Good to be back. Yay. (laughs) Non-Zoom recording. Yeah. Again, we get to stare deeply into each other's eyes. You all have no idea what you're missing. Awkward. (laughs) So wrapping up the end of the year, Christmas is coming. Anything you're excited about? Snow, ready. Yep. Tracking the ski report for Mount Baker. Always head out to kind of central Washington area where my mom lives and is in a winter wonderland. Excited to go visit every year. That's a really nice spot. I'm excited for the holiday shutdown where you can have permission to not care about work for a little while. Mm, I love my work. I love it so much. I love you all, but I can't wait for a little break. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And to do a puzzle or three. How's your training going? Great. Yeah. I can't complain. I'm uh, just continuing to accumulate heavy, but doable sets. Mostly a, you know, still in a four day split. I'm on like week 30 something of this sort of bastardized Texas method. Not really. It's just sort of having a volume slot for each lift and an intensity slot. Adding reps to get closer to failure if I have it for the day. Yesterday, for example, I did three by seven at 308 on the bench press and then three by six at 295 close grip and was just feeling really good. So yeah. the program was three by five, but I just added a couple extra reps to each set to make it a little harder. Okay. I was wondering where the three by seven came from. Yep. No particular rhyme or reason other than my PR, quote unquote PR was three by six at 308. And I decided I, you know, I was feeling good mm-hmm. and it I, was not grindy. Not at all. Yeah. And you know, it's been really weird with bench has just kind of always felt a little achy lately for some reason no matter how much weight's on the bar it's just kind of like i have to get through that achiness in my shoulders and i don't know if it was because i hammered an entire pizza the night before <laughs> and just the fluid retention was you need high to elaborate more on this pizza <laughs> it's uh anchovy and pineapple pizza Ooh, which i heard so gross joe rogan and uh elon elon musk talking about a few weeks ago when I heard about it, I wasn't like, oh, yeah, I've got to try that. But yesterday, I just had this craving for something salty and kind of that umami flavor and a little sweet. And it popped back in my head. I was like, that sounds like exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> and then I sliced up some red onion and some pepperoncini and put it on. It was like all these arguably disgusting flavors. I might be pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so good all these like individually maybe not individually but just like putting them all together sounds disgusting but it was exactly what i wanted and it absolutely crushed the pizza yep and so we even sh- had one of my pieces too yeah and uh, so i think i might had some good shoulder bloat going on yep you ever get shoulder bloat <laughs> <laughs> never when i want to <laughs> i think it changes the dynamics of the shoulder when you're retaining fluid you know yeah I could not drink enough water afterwards. Same. I was waking up. I was so thirsty. I thought I was going to be up all night, but I wasn't. So that liquid went somewhere. Yeah. (laughs) How's your training going? It's really good. I'm having a fun time. Looking forward to training. Deadlifting again. Did some deadlifts. Yeah, that's exciting. Squatting in the hundreds. My big breakthrough is not to sleep on my back. Mm. (laughs) My back seems to not enjoy that. Weird things. But yeah, things have been good. Cool. So uh, what are we talking about today? Well, I've recently added a couple of newer clients to my roster, which I admittedly hadn't done in a while. I've been mostly working with people who have been training for some time. But having gotten to work with these clients, they're asking a lot of questions and they're good questions, which kind of puts me back into that mindset of, 
you know, this is new, it's exciting, it's shiny. They're always wondering what they can do to invest in their training and mm -hmm. what the next thing that they need is. And I thought it'd be fun to answer those questions and other questions that tend to come up from someone who's just starting to work with us or just starting lifting in general. It is really a eye opener when you've been working with the bulk of your clients for, in many cases, years. Yeah. I'd say the average duration of my clients is three, four years, average maybe, yep. maybe even higher than that now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you get somebody who has never lifted before or never consistently barbell trained, it really does take you back. Yeah. And to the point where I remember when I was like that, like I remember wondering about every little detail or, mm -hmm. you know, worrying about every nuance of the equipment, the training, the program my nutrition. What's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, trying to anticipate what's going to happen next or just not sure what's going on with my body because your body's changing right. so much. Yeah. Along with both the good things that change and the sometimes just uncomfortable things that change. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. I think it's, it's fun to, yeah, to, to get taken back to that. And yeah, so yeah, this will be fun. And I can't help but imagine like what they're going to be like in a year. Yeah, you know, right. Like they're going to look back and be like, man, I squatted 65 pounds on that day. Mm -hmm. And now I'm squatting 165. Right. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. To kind of have that vision in my head. What kind of questions are you getting? So one of them that came up pretty soon was about equipment. You know, what kind of equipment do I need in terms of gym equipment? This is beyond the initial investment of like barbell squat rack, but it's like personal equipment and mm. then like little accessory equipment. So things that came up for, you know, what kind of equipment do I need? When and how do I use it? Like educating someone on how to wear their belt. Because that I think okay. is one of the first most uncomfortable things to integrate into training. I thought you were <laughs> going to say Crocs and a dangly cross <laughs> one-sided earring. And Important question. Do you have a haircut broccoli that looks head. like broccoli? <laughs> <laughs> I don't work with those clients. <laughs> those are for Burgos. He can have those ones. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know or haven't been to a public gym yeah. in the last year. That, <laughs> at 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. when high school gets out. <laughs> it's amazing. That's the hot fashion right now. Kids in Crocs and red plaid pajama pants with black tank tops and broccoli haircuts. One dangly earring. Dangly earring, benching, and doing questionable deadlifts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're not talking about that kind of gear. No, we're talking right. about professionals. <laughs> what kind of gear then would you recommend? So lifting shoes for sure. There's so many good ones out there. Like the one filter I would just keep an eye out for is some lifting shoes have a really high heel. I forgot to look at exactly which model it was. But there's an Adidas with a one inch heel. Don't get that one. It's mm. too high. I think yeah. it's too high, especially if you want to wear it for deadlifting, which mm -hmm. I would encourage you to do. Okay. Something around like, I think it's 0.58 is kind of the sweet spot for lifting shoes. Definitely get some of those with the metatarsal strap lifting shoes absolutely and you'll use those like from day one worth investing and if you already have a squat rack and barbells like get the shoes you're gonna use them forever or if you're chaining at a public gym mm -hmm. get the shoes get the shoes yeah i would even get the shoes before the home gym if yeah i mean if you're investing in a home gym and don't have shoes yet that's yeah it's interesting it's interesting mm -hmm. although i have seen that yeah because maybe they've been doing crossfit or something yeah yeah and then yeah the belt has come up and that opens up a whole nother list of questions. What kind of belt should I get? There are four inch belts. There are like one and a half inch or there are like two inch belts that are teeny three inch belts. There are the lever, the double prong, some are 13 millimeters. Those are really thick. The standard recommendation is 10 millimeters. And then there's some that are even thinner at like, I think it's six millimeters. So, you know, how do you filter that down per person? How do I do that? Yeah. You're probably going to be okay with, for most people, the four inch belt, single prong, 10 millimeter. And I will modify that for smaller folk or smaller torso folk. Like hobbits? <laughs> <laughs> that might be better off with a three inch belt. You know, in fact, if I were to take a shot in the dark, I'd probably recommend somebody just start with a three inch belt. Yeah. Because... You can't go wrong and you can always get another one. If you have the luxury of a black iron gym or some sort of a powerlifting gym in the area that I would recommend going to see if they have different belts you can try because 
a lot of it comes down to personal preference and your particular anthropometry. Mm Mm-hmm. And you just don't know until you've had a chance to try that out. And but, they have to be broken in for a little bit too. Because if you get a good one with good leather. Yeah. From my experience, Dominion Strength, yeah. shout out. They come out of the box pretty much broken in. Yeah. But I would agree that especially the thicker, you know, 12 millimeter and up belts, just... those are going to take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I would not in. recommend a new lifter or really anyone under 200 pounds have anything to do with a 13 millimeter belt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just a bit too much. But yeah, that's generally where I'd start. Can't go wrong with three. Yeah. Single prong. Single prong. Over lever, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I have a lever belt and I like it. But I, I don't know. Again, that's personal preference. When you're still trying to figure out where you're at and you might, you know, especially as a new lifter, you might be changing. Your body, your body circumference. The problem with the lever belt is that it's hard to change the, you know, the size, the fit. Yeah. You know, without pulling out a screwdriver. Right. If you had an entire anchovy pineapple pizza, <laughs> you might need to go up, a, go up a notch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I agree. 10 millimeter, three inch single prong leather. And like the places I recommend are definitely Dominion. You can use Logic for 10% off, by the way, if you get it through their website. But they also have belts on Amazon. General Leathercraft or Pioneer, whichever one they go by, they have really cool leather, really great colors, and they have a really great hole system where it's the holes are at slightly different locations, staggered, is that how I could say it? So that it's like, you can make smaller adjustments to the tightness of your belt, which I think is pretty cool. I haven't seen a lot of it lately, but I think they also have a leather belt that's got multiple... Oh, like the SBD one. Settings, yeah. Yeah, So Mm -hmm. you can move it up and down. Yeah. A little bit. But again, these are the kinds of things where you could geek out indefinitely. Yeah. But if we're keeping it simple for a, a new lifter, yeah. then just get a single prong. Follow question for you. How do you know if your belt is in the right spot and how tight should it be? So I generally recommend that you want to be able to fit a finger in between the belt and your body. But it should be like you kind of have to wedge it in there. I prefer to be able to breathe. <laughs> it's important. But it should be probably not something you want to wear around all day. Right. You know, it's yeah. tighter than you would want to just hang out on the couch and watch TV. <laughs> but you can still breathe. Yeah. Because you don't want the belt to constrict you from being able to take a full breath. Right. Like if you suck in and like lengthen your torso so that your waist gets teeny and then put your belt on really tight, you're actually not doing yourself any favors. Right. Yeah. So it's not comfortable. Yeah. But but if it's moving around while you're doing the lift, it's not tight. Yeah, that's another good thing to look for. If you film yourself and you can see when you're getting set that the, yeah. the belt is like moving. Yeah. And you can see different gaps showing mm-hmm. up in your back. That's probably yeah. going to be too loose. Small, one tells. It's going to be like on the smallest part of your waist. Yeah. I think there's a learning curve with the belt, especially I've noticed when someone who's deadlifting and they're still reinforcing the habit of what a good amount of, you know, a rigid back extension looks like. And then they throw the belt on and that totally changes the proprioceptive feedback loop. Yeah. Like now what they thought was extension isn't extension enough because Mm -hmm. they start feeling their belt along their thigh. When you insert that variable, I think it kind of has to make you kind of reassess what depth feels like in the squat and what extension feels like in a deadlift. That's another reason why I recommend starting with a pronged belt because sometimes the hole that you use is different for different lifts. And, you know, a more advanced lifter might even use different belts. Yep. You know, like Matt, for example, will use a three-inch belt for his deadlift, but Mm -hmm. a four-inch belt for his squat and his press. Yep. I will sometimes use a different hole for different lifts. Yeah, because when you're hinging over to do the deadlift, right. there's more of you that's kind of packed up over your waist. Your waist yeah. gets a little bit bigger when you bend over to do a deadlift. I would recommend when you're first starting out and maybe even for advanced lifters to get your extension and your breath and your brace set before you bend over. It's difficult to do, but I like that. you eliminate what you're kind of talking about where you're like trying to figure out where your extension is. But if you take your breath and set your back, puts a little bit of pressure on you to get going with your lift, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. But you got to bend down, bend over, grab the bar, get set, but you're already set. I find that there's less pinching and 
things getting out of place when you just bend over and kind of I like that crush into the bottom. I'm gonna steal that. Yeah. The deadlift conversation made me think that chalk is also something that they need to get or have available chalk or liquid chalk. Yeah. And I've been honestly steering a lot of new folks to straps sooner. I just don't have a whole lot of competitive lifters. Yeah. And I like to train their grip, but I tell them as soon as the grip is the limiting factor, throw straps on. Then they, they don't, don't go to hook grip. I haven't been messing with it as much. Yeah. I don't know. I just that's another thing. Like an uncomfortable belt is just like so distracting. The hook, hook grip. grip. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I just don't find it to be worth the limiting factor. If somebody wants to learn hook grip, absolutely. Or if somebody's plans on competing, great. But I don't know. I just find the straps for a lot of people to be uh to eliminate a variable that doesn't need to be part of their training. Yep. Really important that your grip is strong because it will mess with how well you can set your back. Right. And right, exactly. And I do tell people to warm up without the straps, yeah. which is the reason why I like straps, sometimes even more so than hook grip, because they get a little bit more training. If I teach somebody to do the hook grip, I tell them start with the, the empty bar or yeah. you know, your 135, because it sucks to just throw your hook grip on at 400 pounds or whatever. Yeah. So then they're not quite getting as much grip training. So I'd almost rather them just double overhand their warm up, make that their grip training, and then drive the weight up that they're able to double overhand. Yeah. And then once that becomes a limiting factor, put the straps on and then it's just completely eliminates grip as a problem. Again, asterisks, I'm not talking about people that want to be competitive lifters. And you and I do have actually a, a video on our YouTube channel about how to do the hook grip. Yes. Yeah. And I use the hook grip. I love it. Nothing yeah. wrong with it. It's just for practical reasons. If chalk is a thing that's interfering with your ability to train, because a lot of my clients are either traveling a lot or they're at a Globo gym or they just don't have chalk or they don't want to deal with chalk. Yeah. Straps. Straps. Great. I like, and again, I like Dominion, the leather straps that they make. Really comfortable. Yeah. Those are great. What about knee sleeves? You recommend those? That's that's kind of a personal thing for me. Yeah. At this time of year, I think for most of my clients that are a little bit more experienced in life, it tends to be a nice <laughs> thing to have. That said, my dad, my 73-year-old mm -hmm. dad is cranking away in a garage gym in mm -hmm. Central Oregon, which is freezing this time of year. Just no doesn't, doesn't prefer him. Wrong. Yeah. So I wouldn't put it in the category of like shoes. Yeah. It's not a, you need this in order to train kind of a thing. Yeah. or a belt or even straps. It's more of a, you know, if your knees are kind of bugging you, you're somewhere cold, probably going to feel better. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with them. What about wrist wraps? Wrist wraps. I would put that in the same category as sleeves. So these are the ones you wear on your wrist, folks, for like pressing and benching. Sometimes yeah, squats. our most viewed YouTube video, by the way, I think we're over 1.5 million. Yep. Actually, I've been training with them less and less lately. Yeah, I noticed that. Mostly because I just forget them or, mm. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, it actually, that's how it started. I forgot them. And then I was like, well, what am I going to do? Not train? So I just did it. And it did not seem to make a huge difference. If I was going for an all out 1RM bench press, I'd, it'd probably be good. But I've yeah. hit some 90 plus percent triples without them and yeah. it hasn't really been something where I was like, oh man, I felt unstable. Yeah, I remember looking of a heavy bench press from years ago and I think it was like 180 pounds or something. I didn't have any wrist straps on. Yeah. Yeah. Just didn't, I haven't found it to be a limiting factor. It might be more so on the press. Yeah. I think it's useful on the press because that's yeah. one, like the elbows get to be so related to what the wrists are doing. And if the elbows get out of position, it can really throw off the rep. Yeah. But I would put that one on later on down the road as a priority. Once it seemed like you were redlining and you wanted to start squeezing out a little bit of extra progress, it might make a difference. Same with the knee sleeves. Yeah. Gives you a little bit more confidence to push where you might feel hesitant. And then my last two that I had come up with are fractionals and a dead wedge or some sort of deadlift jack. Those are nice to have. Fractionals yeah. get to be essential. Dead I would, wedge, nice to have. I would say so. More and more of finding that it's hard to program effectively for yeah. new lifters without 1.25. Yeah. That can be a big roadblock on press and bench. Yes. I've definitely been going to that more and more. And 
I have to keep reminding myself that not everybody has that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, that's something that doesn't come in a standard <laughs> yeah. set of plates, you know, that you get for your first home gym setup or at the commercial gym. You have to start carrying them around. So, yeah, I would I actually would put that up there with shoes. Yeah. Get them right away. Very useful. Anything else come up for you in terms of, you know, first oh, dead one? wedge. We didn't dead say wedge. that's probably a good thing that I would have lost perspective on. I don't know. I would just use it. If you've got the 1.25 plates, then you also have a dead wedge. Mm, true. Mm-hmm. In my opinion. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just trained for so long without any kind of a dead wedge or jack that I... Did you also walk to school uphill both ways? Yes, I did. Yep. In the rain. At first, I would pour salt in my eyes. Yeah. Just to make my eyes stronger. <laughs> <laughs> And then I grab knives when they fall (laughs) just to train my reflexes. Train your skin to peel. (laughs) Actually happened this morning. (laughs) Don't grab a knife that's falling off the counter. Also speaks to wrist straps being useful. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think you probably prevented it from slicing my It was really, that's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Safety. Avoid stabbing you in the leg. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a true crime podcast. <laughs> All right. Um, here's another question that I get. How much protein do I need? That is a huge window. Yeah. I think for most people starting out, one gram per pound. When I say most people, I'm saying, you know, the average woman is probably going to be in that 120 to 160 to 180 pounds. The average guy is going to be somewhere in the 180 to maybe 220. You're probably going to be okay starting out with one gram per pound of body weight. And that's easy to remember. Yeah. The technical, what the literature says you can get away with is anywhere from like 0.7 grams up to, depending on what your needs are, two grams per pound. Two grams. But I don't think you're getting useful benefit from going much over a gram, especially if you're a big person, you know, I'm 250 pounds. I don't think I need to be getting 250 grams of protein right. to and support you would be, my training. You'd end up eating probably fewer calories from other sources, which means you might be missing out on nutrients. Right. But for somebody starting out, the average person, one gram per pound. That's Keep great. it simple. It's easy to remember. And you can adjust from there. Yeah. That's what I would recommend. I That's agree. what I tell pretty much everybody to start with. Unless, again, they're a relatively large person, probably don't need that. Yeah, that's true. Which, and I think we did a whole podcast episode on that at one point in time. Yeah. Yeah. For starters, that's a good place to start. Another question that's been coming up, which I actually kind of like discussing more, is like, can I do cardio or conditioning? Or I already do this. Can I keep it going? And my answer tends to be yes. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And lately especially with the longevity discussions that have been around Peter Atia really leading a charge on those. Like he's talks about zone two conditioning cardio quite a bit. Yeah. And zone four and what those parameters are zone two and zone four, that's to do with your heart rate. So zone two is 60 to 70% of your max heart rate. Zone three is 70 to 80. Zone four is more than that. (laughs) That's when you get pretty uncomfortable and you calculate your max heart rate by subtracting your age from 220. So if you wear a watch or something like that, that gives you your heart rate readout, then you can kind of maintain those parameters. And I think according to him, you want like two 40-minute bouts of zone two per week. I might have to double back and look at this, but some exposure to zone two each week and a little bit of exposure to zone four, which is higher intensity, shorter bursts. And then zone two is in that range where it's definitely work. Like it's faster than a walk. Yep. You will very likely not hit it on a walk unless you're going uphill with a rock on or yep. something. So zone two is just a little bit above that, still able to carry on a conversation. I find it to be a mode of conditioning where you can sustain it for a while. Usually you just get bored. Mm. <laughs> I find zone two actually pretty challenging. Yeah, you and I are like different. Yeah, yeah. I get into zone two and then sometimes I just sustain it, drives me up into zone three yeah. or zone four a little bit faster. Yeah. But I actually think it takes a little bit of conditioning to be able to stabilize in zone two. Yeah. Well, I can't do it on a walk, even yeah. with an uphill body, like on a treadmill. I have to really, oh, it's, I, really it's like, I have to really be my huffing it. start hurting. Yeah, my hips start, I just feel like I'm 
speed walking. Yeah. And it's not fun. Yeah. But on a bike, I think I can put enough resistance that the I can hold that a little bit better. But for most people, I tell them, absolutely, please do. Yeah. Especially when they're starting out, actually. I think that it's beneficial to have your strength adaptation, your early strength adaptation occurring while you're doing other conditioning activities. Because my general recommendation is that you can do both. You won't be optimal at both at any point in time, but you will be able to adapt to whatever it is that you're doing if you incrementally MED, you know, minimum effective dose, your adaptation to those. So if you've been doing some level of conditioning, add the strength training in, and as you increase your weight on the bar for your kind of initial gains, you'll adapt yeah. while you're also doing your other conditioning yeah. stuff. You will adapt to what you're doing. Exactly. If you keep doing it. Right. <laughs> so. Now it might at some point, well, I recommend having the conditioning scheduled in a way that minimizes the impact on your and what would that look like? Training. Like I wouldn't have you go do a big zone two workout right before squatting if you're doing a spin class or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I either prefer to have a conditioning activity that affects your legs after your lower body session. And now if you're doing a full body session, squat, bench, dead, then I would like to have it on the same day. I would like to have your training be on a training day. So you have full and, recovery day. And a rest day to be mostly a rest day, unless it's really light. You know, you're just going out for your, your walk or something like that. But if you're doing... A, I think zone two is still okay on those days. I would prefer it not to be on those days. Yeah. That's my recommendation. But I have a client who's doing pickleball on the weekend. And so his Monday lifting session just sometimes gets impacted by that. So we adjust the lifting session and move on. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to be okay. He'll be fine. He comes and then on Wednesday, he's fine. So yeah. it's just. And like the zone two that I recommend is if it's like wanting to do zone two for the sake of doing zone two, my recommendation is a bike because that seems to be one that you can do without messing with your joints too much. You can do it after training or the day after your training. It's not like rowing where it's higher skill. And I think it's tougher to maintain zone two with rowing and it's so similar to the deadlift you know a fun one that i just had a client recommend to me yesterday shout out to eric christensen has been a boxer since he was in high school and he said light bag work Hmm. will jack your heart rate up real quick into that kind of zone two area as well as jump rope oh yeah it makes me think of rich killian rich killian right yeah Mm -hmm. exactly so and i was like yeah Yep. So, if, you know, jump, jump rope yeah. and my knees and back would handle that. <laughs> <laughs> For the less coordinated, I've uh, been great at jump roping. I was double under queen. Really? At CrossFit. Oh, oh yeah. My max consecutive double unders was 222. Wow. Yeah. I can't run, but I can jump in the same location. <laughs> okay. That's cool. So, yeah, double under and light, that like, sounds kind of not fun. hitting hard, yeah. just like kind of moving your arms, moving the arms and, and then again, on that one, though, you probably want to time that so that you're not benching immediately. Yeah. After. <laughs> yeah. That would be one that I would prefer to be on your lifting day after lifting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And then like if you're going to do zone four, so high intensity interval training, you know, on the rower, on the air bike, on the bike, those are good where you get really uncomfortable sled. and then you recover sled. Yep. Yeah. And like you were saying, as with any of these, like don't go two 40 minute bouts plus a 20 minute zone four you know, two 40 minute boat zone two and then another zone four in addition to new lifting. Like I've been kind of starting people on like 20 minute bouts of zone two for a couple of weeks and we'll add a little bit, then we'll add a little mm-hmm. bit and just, you know, progressing it upward. Yep. Do you get the, what should I do for my warm up question? All the time. Yeah. Yes. That's one that I forget that is something to learn. Yeah. And <laughs> often it's not someone will do it just right. There's going to be no warming up or a whole bunch of warming up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is definitely all over the place. Yeah. And the tricky thing about recommending a warm up is it is another one of those personal preference things, at least in the sense that I think as somebody trains longer, they learn what works better for them. Because I can give a standard recommendation, but over time, you're going to develop the things that you like to do. 
And it changes, I've also noticed, over time. Yeah. As you're lifting more weight or as you are... Doing different lifts each day. Doing different exercises, feel different to warm up. The sequence of the exercises that you do. Time of the year. Some people will get it in their head that I think that deadlifting doesn't need a whole lot of warm up, but they forget that as a new lifter, typically that's the third lift of the session. So you've already done a bunch of work and you're already warmed up. And then when you get to a, maybe your program changes and the deadlift is the first lift, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I actually do need to warm this up yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyways, as a general rule of thumb, I recommend the simple answer is to take somewhere between three to five sets to get up to your work weight. And this is assuming somebody's doing, you know, three sets across or something for their work set. So, you know, let's say you're warming up to 225. You would start with the empty bar. Yeah. That's probably what I should have said first. Always start with the empty bar or maybe even just some body weight stuff. If the empty bar is a lot of weight for you and just start the movement. I don't personally think you need a whole lot of stretching or foam rolling or you might if it's cold yeah want to get on a bike or a rower it might feel good yeah to, to just warm up your temperature get the blood flowing yeah but you can do that with squats Yeah, you generally tend to get warm by your second warm-up set yeah yeah and then by the time you factor in walking around the gym putting weights on the bar putting your knee sleeves on that's always a workout for me one thing that i have found with newer lifters that i sometimes need to emphasize because there's often not a whole lot of weight on the bar is that you do need to warm up yes yeah <laughs> it's it can be easy <laughs> and one of the things that is that has caught me by surprise a few times is some people starting out will just put the work weight yeah. directly on the bar yeah you know you might need to do two or three sets at a at an empty bar because you're only warming up to 85 pounds or something, you know, 95 pounds. So make sure you're, as a rough guideline now, I'm probably more inclined to sweat than some people. <laughs> I generally like to have a little bit of a sweat going okay. by the time I get to my work set, but find out whatever that is for you. Maybe it's just that you can feel your heart rate, your skin's flushed a little bit, you feel warm by the time you get to your work set. You know, yeah. a lot of that's gonna depend on the climate that you're training in. But yeah. <laughs> if you're in Houston in July, you're probably sweating just walking, sweating. walking yeah. in the door. <laughs> yeah, like you said, empty bar for a couple sets of five, maybe 10. Yeah. And then like another three, four, if you're lifting a lot, maybe a fifth set before you hit your warm-up set. But yeah, pretty even jumps, decrease the number of reps as you get closer to your work set, general guideline, yeah. Another subjective feeling that I like to recommend is that, you know, your warm-up, you want, to ideally, as you're increasing the weight, feel confident about the movement, which is tricky for somebody who's starting out. But let me bear with me here. Like sometimes as you're warming up, there's these, it almost feels like you're, it's just like super achy and you're kind of hesitant going into the bottom of a squat, for example, or, you know, now, I'm setting aside aches, tweaks, and right. pains. So that, that could be a whole nother discussion. But just general movement, you want to start feeling like you're getting into a groove, mm -hmm. if you will. And I, I, this is something I just think to myself. Sometimes I catch myself skipping the opportunity with the empty bar or 135 to feel like I can be more aggressive coming out of the bottom. Mm. Like, remember, so it's, it's worth being really intentional with your warm-ups. Yeah, we're trying to move the weight. We're trying to move heavy weight. We're trying to be powerful with the movement. So I'm not saying you're going to feel perfectly confident every time as you're warming up. Maybe there's some doubt or there's a little tweak or some ache or pain that's always there. But as much as possible, you know, try to feel like you're... Like you're ready to try. Ready to... Yeah, that's a... Yes, that's a good way to put it. Like, you know, on the way down to the bottom of the squat, I think once you're warmed up, you feel like you're ready to get the bounce, you know, hit the weight hard, be aggressive with it. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Some lifters will maybe overdo it on the warmups because they want it to be perfect before going to the yeah, warm set. Careful yeah. with this whole chase for perfection. Right. That is something that I think is really important is like if you are assessing and analyzing every lift on every rep, you are going to be all over the place and it's not right. worth that. Yes, things need to be moving in a way that facilitates a good training range of motion and allows you to 
progressively move yourself further. But if you are constantly chasing perfection, you're going to be stuck at the empty bar forever. Yeah, I'm thinking more of the type of person who's only taking one or two, maybe yeah. three warm-up sets. Yeah. And a sign that you might be rushing your warm-up is if your last set is your best set. I notice often happens with the press, which I think is because the fundamental problem is it's usually the lightest Yeah, they're lift. usually sometimes only 10 pounds between the empty bar and the work set. Right. Yeah. So I think the same thing can be true with the squat or the deadlift. It's yeah. just that usually those are heavier, so you just by default... People yeah. tend to take more jumps, but some people will, you know, do two jumps to their squat also. So if you notice that your second and your third set feel the best, you're probably undershooting on the warm up. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a good one. All right. Final question. The final boss. How long will my linear progression last? <gasps> it's typically 12 and a half weeks. I think Just we kidding. should get some up. very specific numbers <laughs> yeah. and then call into question manhood and worthiness as a human yeah. virtue <laughs> that if you don't hit these numbers and then we can spend the next two years responding well andrew said <laughs> that if i ate two grams of protein per pound of body weight and i warmed up this way <laughs> so the answer is we don't know it's gonna last a little while longer probably than where we're at right now so many variables <laughs> yeah. I would say, generally speaking, if it is lasting less than two or three months, either you started too heavy or you're more advanced than might meet the eye. Maybe you've been training for a while, which is another variant of starting, quote unquote, too heavy, whatever too heavy is. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I would roughly say two to three months. But again, there's a lot of variables in there. Yeah. And I can see why you want to be excited about it because yeah. that beginning stage of lifting is very important and it's really exciting. But the point is that you're doing the lifts, learning how to do them well, and the weight is increasing at a pretty steady rate. Yeah. But putting an end date on it is worth knowing that's going to go higher, but I don't like the idea of creating this specific map. Yeah. I wouldn't say there's any kind of should or standard or I wouldn't even call it an expectation, but I would call it an observation that mm -hmm. I would say the average person that I've worked with can get typically a solid three months, two yeah. to three months. And then key variables beyond three months are a combination of how consistent they can be and how much calories they're willing to eat. Yeah. You know, honestly, like somebody, I mean, I've seen LPs go for six months. They tend to be, but not always, the person who's gaining a good amount of weight. More testosterone, more calories, yeah. more LP. Right. Yeah. And then it's also lift specific. Mm -hmm. I would add on top of that, I've seen some squat and deadlift LPs last frequently beyond the three month window. I also think it depends on what you consider the LP. Yeah. Do you consider it an LP if they're still adding weight? consistently in terms of like a line over Still time linear progression but it's only twice a week instead of three times a week or do you only consider it when they're adding it every single session you know i kind of see it as different sloped lines over time that could go nine months a year but it might be a very you know not a very steep slope towards the end maybe you're adding weight once every three weeks or four weeks but it's linear over some given period of time yeah yeah <laughs> They're not backtracking. So that's why it's such a gray question to answer. But are they training three days a week? Are they training four days a week? Right. Yeah. The answer is, we don't know. It's going to be a couple months probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then what happens after that is you'll keep training. Right. Well, and also depends on how bad they want to keep the LP going. Yeah. Because, yeah, there are different choices you can make where that's the, the main exactly. mover. Yeah. So many trade-offs. What I would say is the key factors after you've gone through that standard two to three months are what trade-offs do you want to make in your training and your personal lifestyle, whether it's the capacity you have to prioritize sleep and recovery, to include eating, your consistency, what other stresses are going. I mean, that one's probably the biggest factor is yeah. that be like, oh, can't believe my LP ended, but I just changed jobs, moved, 
and oh, bought and a I new house. A bottle of wine. And I dropped and yeah. drank a... <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, things matter. Cool. Well, that's a lot for someone to get going on. The beginning of lifting, that's, you know, it's a change management like series of months right there. That's, that's a yeah. good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there will be things that you didn't expect, things that you did expect that turned out differently, to opportunities to be really frustrated, opportunities to be really proud. I came across this thing popped up in my Instagram recently and I loved it. And it was four parents having a conversation with their kid who wants to quit something. I loved it because the answer from, I think it was from an Olympic athlete was, okay, how about quit on a good day? If you want to quit, you can quit. You can quit. But how about don't quit on a bad day because you're going to have bad days in everything that you do and everything you love. Mm-hmm. But the deal is, how about if you're going to quit, quit on a good day? I like that. And I thought that was really cool. I like your change management perspective too because it's using the Atomic Habits framework. A lot of what's changing during this period of time is the lifter's identity We're behind it all. Adding a lifter identity. Right. They're changing who they perceive themselves to be, which is at the heart of the behavior change, which gets the outcome. And that's a, you know, it's a fun time. Mm -hmm. You're kind of like figuring out who this new version of myself is that's a lifter, that trains. Just making these choices and taking these actions and deciding not to do other things. And, you know, on the surface, it might seem like it's what shoes or, but behind it all, I think is that person trying to figure out how they fit in this new kind of identity and set of habits. It's fun. Fun to be strong. (laughs) I love it. Well, thank you, Andrew. That was really helpful. And thank you for listening. We hope you got something useful out of this. If you did, we would love a review and a share. And I think that's it for now. We're going to do a QA and a episode probably next week or the week after. Looking forward to hearing what comes in for that. And thank you for listening. That's it. I'm going to wrap up this closing conversation really wishing Andrew would chime in and say goodbye and yet I'm still talking. Goodbye. Okay.